The following is a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, too commonly and too sadly, I am reminded that there is a challenge today that many pastors face. It's not unique to one church or to one city or to one state. It is common throughout our country. The challenges that pastors face is how to get people back into their Bibles. Too often, too commonly, people are simply sort of living through the spirituality of their local church leaders. Our pastor has read the Bible. Our pastor has prepared a lesson from the Bible. Our pastor will teach us that accordingly, and as a result, we will just sort of live off of his daily devotion. We might dabble in the Word a bit, but we will not necessarily spend much time there or many days there. Sadly, this has been the case even by LifeWay's research results has found that only 19% of church-going Christians read the Bible once a day. 25% of the people who are church-going Christians maybe a couple times a week. 14% once a week. 22% once a month will read the Bible. And 18% who go to church regularly actually never read the Bible. Well, that's a tragedy for a number of reasons one of which is you don't really know the God of your salvation. And the opportunity to be comforted and encouraged and challenged and equipped and instructed from the Word of God. It is indeed the Word that transforms as the Spirit uses the Word to bring about change in His people's lives. But what's even more tragic than this is how often, though, many pastors, even being aware of such statistics, will ask so little and furthermore offer so little to their own people when it comes to delivering the Bible on Sundays or times of gathering in midweek. It's almost as if the Bible is but a, an appetizer to the real entree of the pastor's thoughts. It's as if it's but a sampler into what really is going to be the enjoyable conversation about the latest sociological or technological developments. Too often and too sadly, There is an amazing amount of talk going on in churches that is so light from the Scriptures. Scriptures might be mentioned in passing almost as a polite hat tip, if you will, to the Scriptures. God is here with us. Let's at least acknowledge that in His Word. Thank you for that verse. Now let's go on to the thoughts I have. That's not our desire. Christians desire and should continually desire to feast on all of God's Word, that this is the whole counsel of God not just part of it, but all of it. And all of it is inspired from God, inerrant, infallible, authoritative, sufficient, and clear for us today to understand and apply. And so we are desiring to do that. And that's why we're committed to expository preaching and teaching here. We want the text of Scripture to frame us as a church. Not only frames the the preacher's lesson, also frames our lives. Thus saith the word is too often a phrase that's rarely heard today not for its archaic language of King James translation perhaps, but actually command of knowing God's Word. Well, this morning, we're reminded as we return back to 1 Timothy, not a book that we've been sampling, that we've been nibbling on, but a book that we've been consuming. Over the last 14 weeks, we've been working our way through verse by verse by verse, and we have learned a lot for us as a church. We have not wanted to simply use 1 Timothy as a chance to sort of teach on other topics that reminds us of something else, but rather having learned much. In these last 14 weeks, we have received advice on facing doctrinal error, confusion over what constitutes proper worship, what to do about a lack of qualified leaders, as every church might have its season of that temptation or concern, and what to do with materialism that so easily plagues us, particularly in our society. Paul has also taught us that training and godliness applies to all Christians by application, not just by leaders. We've also learned how to care for different people in the church in such a way that their needs are being cared for beyond their family who perhaps are not able to care for them, especially widows. We have learned about gender roles. Speaking about gender confusion today, there's gender confusion in the church. The Scriptures have provided that kind of clarity in public worship and the relationship that we should have between the church and the state, and what is the basis for the world being evangelized. We've also been taught who is behind the false teaching in the church, 
nothing less than satanic conspiracy itself, why churches pay pastors, and why contentment is superior to all earthly possessions you could ever hope to accumulate. To say that 1 Timothy is applicable to us today would be an understatement of great magnitude. Well, we come back to it again this morning for our final installment in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through verse 21. We're sort of really ending where we have started. If I could just ask you to look at chapter 1, verse 1, just to remind you, to take you down memory lane here. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord almost with bookend fashion, with these first two verses and the verses that immediately follow. So Paul picks up on this tone and this focus here and these following verses in verses 11 to 21 of chapter 6. As he speaks to Timothy with a most personal and yet exhortatory tone as he wants him to understand the nature of his calling. And so we see here from the lesson this morning what a faithful pastor is known for. Timothy has been called to pastor this church at Ephesus, to join with the existing leaders, some to be removed, new ones to be added, and other ones to be strengthened. But as he gives leadership to them, what should his pastorate look like? This is not just a lesson that applies 2,000 years ago. It's a lesson that's true today. And so first of all, in our text this morning, we see that a faithful pastor is to flee evil and pursue righteousness. Flee evil and pursue righteousness. Look at our text. Paul writes, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Now, notably, we are picking up where we've left off in verse 10 of last week, and that explains this introduction here in verse 11, but as for you, it's a, it's a contrast from what's happened in verse 10. You notice in verse 10, he talked about some have wandered away from the faith, but as for you, Timothy, as for you, here are the things that you need to realize. And he gives him this most commendable of titles. I mean, honestly, it's, a, it's an accolade and an affirmation that would both encourage and sober at the same time. As for you, O man of God. Now, this is not just simply polite speech here in apostolic writing. This actually has a, a really a call to arms here. It's saying perhaps more than perhaps today's natural eye would see in this text, if not knowing well the Scriptures, specifically what we refer to today as the Old Testament. You see, Timothy was raised in the Scriptures, specifically taught by his mother and grandmother the Scriptures. He knew what it was that they were taught, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your mother, Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure now dwells in you, speaks about how he was taught these things. And the significance here of this term, O man of God, is because of how it was first found in the Scriptures. It's a common title, a common description given in the Old Testament, the first person of which is Moses himself in Deuteronomy 33. And continuing throughout the Old Testament, you see that a man of God is, a, is an individual who represents God by proclaiming His Word. He had a, a prophetic voice, if you will. And when he spoke, God spoke through him. By calling his child in the faith, the very description we read just a few minutes ago in chapter 1, verse 2, by calling his child in the faith a man of God, he's not somehow trying to move him up to spiritual maturity age quickly. He's actually reminding him of his calling, his calling. Paul is placing Timothy into that Old Testament lineage, that Old Testament tradition that he, like those before him, was called, ordained, and responsible to preach the Word of God as a man of God. Timothy had a difficult assignment. It's the city of Ephesus, 
It's not a city done with churches in every part of town like many of our cities in America today still have church buildings and church representations, whether there are various levels of health is another matter altogether. But this is the church in the city of Ephesus, a church in the city of Ephesus, the one and only church in the city of Ephesus that is known for its pagan worship. And he is addressing this issue of this difficult assignment. Timothy is going to need to restore truth and order to this church in Ephesus that had lost its way. Paul has already mentioned the dangers of false teachers three times in his epistle. The apostle has followed each of these warnings to Timothy with the charge to resist the call to give up. Timothy needed to know he was God's man. He was a champion, championing not his opinion, not his personality. He was championing the Word of God believing that God knew what was best for God's people. So what does he tell them? He tells them, where does he begin? Flee. Flee these things. This term flee that he's using here is an interesting term. It's the same word that we get the use of the term today, fugitive. You think of somebody who's on the run, does not want to be caught, at all expense will do everything they can to avoid being captured. There was an event that happened this past summer that was the, one of the most remarkable events uh, in our sabbatical as a family, and it was our opportunity as a family to sit with a man who was a prisoner of war in the Vietnam War. He was a young naval pilot. He was shot down. And he described what it was like when he had first landed and how he hid and how he buried himself basically in a mud trench. And he went on to describe the tragedy of what ended up happening, how he was captured by some local farmers there in Vietnam and then handed over to the communist soldiers and was held hostage for not seven days, not seven weeks, not seven months, but seven years. Seven years as a prisoner of war tortured, treated the most unbelievably cruel ways until the last time when they started to prepare him for release. And as I read this text, I'm reminded of his story of what it would have been like to be captured, to be held hostage, and anything he would have done at the beginning to not have that happen, happened. Paul is telling Timothy, something is pursuing you. And when it captures you, if it captures you, it will relentlessly torture you. It will take no rest. It will not respect you for being weary. It will continually assault you. You need to flee it. You need to run relentlessly from it in a way that is exerting all the effort and energy you have. And he says, flee these things. So what are these things? Well, the antecedent here, immediately in the text, was this love of money, which is a, a sense of greed, a, a motivation for self. He's saying, Timothy, if you're in ministry for yourself, get out. Don't do that. Don't be in it for that. But it's not only money that's a point of concern for pastors, for leaders in the church. When this issue comes up in other scriptures in the New Testament, the man of God is to flee sexual sin. The man of God is to flee idolatry. The, the man of God is to flee youthful lusts. Friends, the man of God is not to be an exception to others in Christian life. The question is, what are you running from? Too often, too many of us are saying, it's too hard I'm too tired, I give up, I surrender. Paul is telling Timothy, you cannot take this course of action. You are to flee, you are to run. But notice, it's not only what he's running from, it's also what he's running to. He's running from these things, but he's pursuing what? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. This idea here of righteousness is this understanding of dealing with this right relationship with God. But the significance here is that the fruit of the one who has believed in the gospel is one who is consequently seeking holiness. See, anybody who professes to be a Christian, but noticeably, repeatedly, habitually is known for not seeking holiness, 
we have every reason in humility to kind of scratch our heads and wonder, I wonder if you're a Christian. What gives you the right? Oh, I have no right. But the Word of God has every right to say, I think there's a legitimate concern here. For the things that you're supposed to be pursuing seem to be not interested to you. Speaks about righteousness not because as if Timothy himself can claim it personally, but rather because of his right standing in Christ through faith, it should be illustrated by his right living before others. And to begin to sort of compound these descriptions, righteousness is dealing with Timothy's outward behavior, while godliness is dealing with his internal behavior, his, his motives and his desires, his attitudes. It's not just his righteousness and his godliness, it's also his faith. How does Timothy respond to the providence of God? How do you respond to the providence of God? Are you easily shaken or easily stirred by what happens in life when things go as not as you expect it? describes his love as being something that he'd be known in his response to others. In this verbal tense, this reality, his steadfastness and his response to trials, things will not be easy. His gentleness, even when encountering people that will not be easy to shepherd and deal with, the church at Ephesus will take a lot of hard work. He's not going to expect standing ovations after every one of his charges. There will be those who will grumble and complain, false teachers who will not give up easily, says, Timothy, this is what you're to be pursuing. A faithful pastor flees evil and pursues righteousness. Now, the question is, how does this happen? How do you get leadership like this? How do you become like this? Well, tragically, too often in ministry, there is a reoccurring regular temptation to provide the professionalization of ministry without having first had the personal impact of that very word itself in your life. I'm reminded of what Charles Bridges said in his book on Christian ministry. He says, for if we should study the Bible more as ministers than as Christians, more to find matter for the instruction of our people than food for the nourishment of our own souls, We neglect then to place ourselves at the feet of our divine teacher. Our communion with him is cut off, and we become mere formalists in our sacred profession. We cannot live by feeding others or heal ourselves by the mere employment of healing our people. And therefore, by this course of official service, our familiarity with the awful realities of death and eternity may be, rather, may be rather like that of the grave digger, the physician, and the soldier, than the man of God, viewing eternity with deep seriousness and concern and bringing it to his people, the profitable fruit of his contemplation. interesting to me that in the light of this charge that Paul tells Timothy where to look, what to pursue, he turns him ironically not to the people first but to himself. Not in an act of pride but an act of humble reflection. So different than what we heard earlier in chapter 4 verse 16, talking about that all will see your progression. He says in verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this For for so by doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Here he is again, similarly in verse 11 of chapter 6, flee these things and pursue these things. Second lesson that a faithful pastor is to pursue is a fight for the faith. A fight for the faith. Many of you know this from personal experience, having been involved in athletics, the value of coaches. Coaches have an interesting role. It does seemingly strike you as odd that in one sense these, these professionals or volunteers, depending on the level of athleticism in which they're competing, have an ability to instruct another person in an endeavor that they yet can't do themselves, but yet perhaps for a time did do it themselves. And so they instruct out of their own knowledge and in their own experience. And the role of a coach, as we understand, is to, is to motivate, is to instruct, is to correct, is to inspire. Is to inspire. 
And they do this. They do this before the game. They do this during the game. They do this after the game. Some of the most motivational speeches that have been captured in history have been those in athletics. Those coaches have instructed those who seemed like it was hopeless and yet brought them back, motivating them. Paul is like a coach here for Timothy. He's like he's shouting in his ear in the corner of the boxing ring, and he says in verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession and the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who is in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Paul is telling Timothy, fight for the faith. Fight for the faith. You notice this in the very beginning here in verse 12, this call to fighting. It's a term that's used commonly in military athletic context. He's describing a level of discipline and concentration and conviction and a work ethic needed to win. It's like, Timothy, this is not going to be easy. I know there have been those who have aspired to ministry because of the sort of distant observation that it seems like a a sort of a sweet opportunity as a Christian who loves the Word and loves talking about the Word with people, what better way to do that than to become someone who's in ministry full-time, be a pastor? I have had the conversations with people in seminary, sitting next to them in classes. What brought you here? Tell me about your call to ministry. Tell me about the churches that affirmed you being here. And they basically said in so many words, oh, I'm here because I love the Word. Praise God. And as I was saying, back to my question, but, but why here? As a lot of Christians love the Word. I hope all Christians love the Word, but why are you here? Well, I'm here because of the desire to, to be able to learn it better. Awesome. And I want to talk about with others. Okay. And it dawns on me in this conversation, they really have no clue about what it is they're saying that they aspire to. Ministry is hard work. It's not met all the time with happy, friendly, smiling faces. There's a reason why earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 3, why it's important, as well as in Titus 1, that that elders must be known for teaching sound doctrine and refuting false doctrine. Because inevitably, without rest, continually tempting the people of God, they are going to be drawn away by their own desires, by the desires of the world, by the desires of Satan. They're going to be lured into false teaching, and it is a relentless work that is nothing less than what Paul describes here, a fight, an adversarial, fist-brawling fight. And you can't say, well, I've done this before. I now get to rest. There's not retirement. The tense in which he writes here is a sort of present reality. It's this present command. It's an ongoing sense. It's a continuous call to battle here. This is nothing different than what Paul was doing himself. It even says later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, where he says, I have fought the good fight. See, Paul understands he never calls Timothy to do something he doesn't do himself. He's telling him here, fight the faith. Fight for the faith. This word faith is a euphemism for the Word of God, the the body of Christian truth. We see this already in Jude chapter 3 where where the writer there says, the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. You see, this idea here is that Timothy has made this confession. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and about which you made the good confession and the presence of many witnesses. Now, a couple of things just to note here, and that is basically the idea of theological summaries. You have this earlier in chapter 4. If you just look back to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, verse 16, you'll see it even with the language that Paul says as he's sort of 
really dealing with verses 14 to 16 of the of the, the center, the epicenter of 1 Timothy is found here in these verses. But he has what's found in verse 16 as this honestly believed to be this New Testament early church confession of faith. Church was not believing that this was all there was to believe about Jesus or all there was to say about Jesus, but here's a succinct summary of it. Verse 16, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, taken up in glory. It's one example of many examples in the New Testament of what were known historically as church confessions. We value them as church history has valued them in the past as why we even as our own church have a church confession. This is what we believe the Bible in summary to say of significant importance that we must agree to, to identify with each other in a covenant community. Paul has made a confession. Timothy has made a confession. And this confession, it says here, is in the presence of many witnesses. It's a confession of faith in Christ and a confession of belief in His Word as it was taught to him. Now, this confession was probably made, first of all, at Timothy's baptism. Baptism in the New Testament is like the New Testament altar call. The altar call is kind of a recent invention. It wasn't really around until about the last 100 years. People kind of publicly coming forward and responding in some manner. It was kind of made popular in the crusades of the 20th century and revivalistic Christianity as a means to communicate publicly of what you had believed or desired to believe privately, which is the repentance of your sin and faith in Christ. The New Testament, you never find that being recorded anywhere. And what they would do in the New Testament was what we still should still do today, which is baptize. This is the Great Commission, right? Make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. So you, you become a Christian, you are baptized as a statement of that belief in Christ, and then you're taught how to observe all that Christ has commanded. Ironically, it includes being baptized. And Timothy would have made this confession of his faith at his baptism. However, he would have done so again as well at his ordination. His ordination to ministry, which we're even reminded in 2 Timothy chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 1, verse 6, remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands, of my hands. He's reminding Timothy to continue to be faithful to what's been entrusted to him. And look at what he says here. He says, I charge you to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. And I purposely sort of skip over what he says there in the middle there at verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God. We'll get into the section here on God because it's arguably one of the most theologically rich and dense sections here in all of 1 Timothy about the character of God and the significance of that. But for our purposes, first, let me just show you what he's talking about here. I charge you to keep this commandment unstained and free from reproach. He's basically saying, Timothy, be faithful to your calling. Be faithful to your calling. This is what you are to do. This is how you are to live. The responsibility. Now, how does Paul bring this to bear as far as the weight of it, the gravitas of it? Nothing less than the very doctrine of God. Nothing less than the very character of God. It's as if he brings to the witness stand, as if he brings into the, to the, the, tr- the locker room or as a coach, he's giving his charge, no one less than God himself. And you look at how it first comes out here. He says, I charge you, verse 13, in the presence of God. Basically saying, God is my witness. God is my witness. What kind of God are we talking about? Well, notice how he begins to describe God. First of all, verse 13, God who gives life to all things. Notice how commonly and frequently the Bible just assumes creation. There's no apologetic for it, no defense of it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Oh, wait, let me stop and just make sure you understand there is a God, and let me stop and make sure you understand creation. The Bible's presupposition, as is illustrated in all of creation, is that there is a God, and He's responsible for everything we see. That's exactly what Paul's doing here. Oh, God, who gives life to all things. So he's talking about God the Father. Now he directs his attention to Christ the Son and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. What's he talking about here? He's saying, Timothy, take encouragement from the historical example of no one less than Jesus Christ himself, who stood before Pontius Pilate 
the, the political ruler at that time who had the power seemingly politically of life and death and Christ would not waver. One of the great examples I find, and I would encourage you to find as well, in the faith by which I'm called to live today as a Christian, let alone as a pastor, is simply reading historical biographies of Christians who have lived before me. Some of you maybe have never read a Christian historical biography. I would say, friend, you are missing out. You're missing out. And I would encourage you to see me or one of your pastors say, hey, give me a good book to read. I love to read people in church history, a man or a woman, somebody here in our country, someone outside of our country, some other time in society. I'd love to read about people. Well, what's happening here is that Paul is historically drawing Timothy's attention back to someone in history, but it's no one less than Jesus Christ himself. And this historical act of how Christ kept the charge, how he did not waver. Now look at what he says here about Jesus. In verse 14, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now do we see that God is creator. Secondly, we see that Christ is returning. Now this is significant to just pull the car over here and make clear what we're talking about as Paul's writing. The return of Christ, so we think about Christmas time, the, the Advent. Advent means coming, the first coming of Christ. Significant. We live in light of that. We live as a result of that. Our faith is in Christ because of that. However, it continues in light of the second coming yet still to happen, that Christ will return and he will judge the world according to his righteousness, Acts 17. And it describes this as Jesus is one who is to come. This is a cardinal doctrine for the Christian faith. Let me be even more specific. Somebody who professed to be a Christian who did not believe in the return of Christ could not be a Christian. They'd be believing in some other Jesus than the Jesus of the Scriptures. He is alive and well, reigning and sitting at the right hand of God the Father and promising to return as the commander-in-chief and in his appearing will have to give, we will have to give an account this is sobering Timothy up for this reminder. The, until the appearing of our Lord, and then he continues into this description of God and his character, verse 15, which he will display at the proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign. Now we're dealing with the sovereignty of God. And it continues into this verse here, in verse 15, the very end, the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is a description here that would be significant for them to understand why. Because the reminder that God is truly the only God that exists. In a city full of many gods, God is the only God that truly exists. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. You don't believe me? Just ask Nebuchadnezzar. Again in verse 16, he is holy. So look at this in verse 16. Who alone has immortality? What is this saying here? That God exists in eternity. He is not subject to death. Again, verse 16, who dwells in unapproachable light to whom no one has ever seen or can see. He's dealing with God's holiness. To him be all honor and eternal dominion, deserving all praise. What's happening here? Here's what's happening here, because this is largely going to be missed on you if you don't understand this. At this time in Roman society, there was an emperor cult, if you will, The emperor of Rome is believed to be God. Now, there are other gods being worshipped at that time, but the emperor himself. In fact, it was customary to acknowledge regularly, Caesar is Lord, be an expression to be stated. Caesar is Lord. Christians, of course, would say, Jesus Christ is Lord. What Paul is wanting to remind Timothy is that only God has honor and power everlasting. Sure, you're going to see political powers rise, and you're going to see them fall. Sure, people will be born and be powerful and be rich and be successful, and then they will fade. Only God is immortal. Only he is holy. Only he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And this is to to put some steel in Timothy's spine in the face of the opposition he's going to have going up against what he's going to go up against in the church. So the first 
call for a faithful pastor is to flee evil and pursue righteousness. Secondly, to fight for the faith. Thirdly, look at what he says here, warn the rich, verse 17 to verse 19. Warn the rich. This is interesting how this comes in, but it's not that interesting in light of what was just covered in the end of verse 10 and verse 9. Look at what it says here. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Part of Timothy's courage is needing to deal with the people in the church that have a lot of money. And typically, people who have a lot of money have a lot of power. Usually, it's come as a result of their money, or the money's come as a result of their power. And they would have significant influence in the church. Now, we understand that the church is not made up of that. As earlier we saw in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, we have slaves in the church. The church is filled with people of different economic statuses and different rankings and different accomplishments, people who are from both sides of the tracks, if you will. What he's saying, though, Timothy, is that this charge to be faithful as a pastor means you need to deal with people and where they are in life. Specifically, he says here, deal with the rich people. Now, why is he dealing with them? Because remember earlier in verse 10, he says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. He's saying, listen, there are teachers in the church who having an unhealthy craving desiring to use godliness as a means for their great gain, that they could get money for it, they might draw into their following rich people who might think as well too highly of money. So what he says here is simply this. Number one, don't trust in money. Don't trust in it. And what I find interesting is he doesn't say get rid of it. He doesn't say get rid of it. He's not saying if you're rich, you should feel bad because other people around you are not rich. I hope you just have this sort of low-grade, bad conscience. But what can help you is the sooner you can get rid of it, the better off you are. It's actually not what Paul is telling Timothy to teach here to rich Christians in the church. It's not saying this is how you're to deal with people with money. He's actually saying you need to pastor them in light of this because of the particular challenges that they might face. First of all, it says not to be haughty. It's another word for being proud. Friend, have you accomplished something of great status in life? Are you from a rather prestigious school? Do you have a possession or possessions that is to be admired and appreciated? And do you sort of find your identity in them? Oh, you're just becoming haughty with that. You're not to see yourself as being any different than anybody else. You're not to be haughty. And it says, furthermore, it says, you're not to have their hopes set on the uncertainty of riches. What is so crazy about people who, who have money is you would think once they have that amount of money, they would sort of rest. But then what ends up happening is they end up spend so much of their time protecting the money because their hope is in the money and all that it can buy for, provide for their future. Paul is telling Timothy, teach people in the church, riches will not provide for you a future, a certainty. Only God can do that. Look at what it says there. Who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. It's, a, it's an ironic kind of turn of a phrase here about riches, where the true riches come from, God, who gives all things to enjoy. Now, this is where I think it's really wonderful in the liberty we have in Christ. If God has given you riches, you're okay to enjoy them. You shouldn't have to feel bad about them, but you shouldn't be proud of them. You shouldn't put your hope in them. And furthermore, you should be known in life for more than just them. And that's what he gets into here in verse 18. Rich people are to be known for doing good, rich in good works, being generous and ready to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Interestingly, recently the, the news was broke about Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. He and his wife, the rival of their new daughter, 
have announced in a letter to their daughter that they'll be giving away 99% of his Facebook shares, which he says is valued at $45 billion today. Honestly, when I read that news, I'm like, wow. I mean, like, $45 billion. I don't even know what that even means, right? I'm like, it's, it's abstract. I'm like, it sounds a lot. <laughs> I bet you could do a lot with that. I mean, it's just like, it's so far outside of my reference point. And I feel like I know you guys pretty well enough to say, outside of any of your reference point. I can put us all together outside of all of our reference point. But nevertheless, a commendable action here, which we see how God even uses the hearts of people who maybe don't intend to worship Him or honor Him, to how He still can do good and sort of provide for people in society, even through unbelievers. Sort of commend that. But ironically, there can even be a twist with people and their motive for doing such good works. I by no means mean to imply this with a motive for Mark Zuckerberg. I appreciate it for he and his wife and their generosity. The question, though, is in our acts of generosity, what motivates us? What are we ultimately trying to accomplish? As we have been blessed, how is that becoming a blessing to others? How are we positioning ourselves to be generous and ready to share? thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation, here we go, for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. If you're a young professional, you perhaps have begun to think through the reality that you've got to save now for your future and some sort of ability to provide for yourself lest you presume upon your future and always being healthy and being able to provide for yourself. And so this is a common conversation in our society. It's not common in every part of the world, but in our society, how we plan. We have retirement accounts and things like this. Well, what Paul is doing here is he's talking about a future even beyond your life. It's kind of what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 6, about where you store up your treasure, where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. He's saying, what does your portfolio look like of your investment well beyond your simple financial investment. Timothy needs to teach those in the church, warn them accordingly, commend them accordingly to live like this. And the fourth thing he tells Timothy to do is to guard the gospel. Verse 20, O Timothy, earlier we read, O man of God, here it's personal again, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called, quote-unquote, knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. The faith. Grace be with you. Let me ask you a question. If you knew someone was going to attack your home tonight, There's no police to call. There's no place to go. But danger is imminent. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. (laughs) Would you go to bed? (laughs) Not a chance in the world. You would be alert and ready and diligent and up all night so that you might be prepared to fend off and fight against whatever you were told was going to come. Why? Because you're protecting those whom you love that you live with. Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, opposition is coming. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to protect. You're going to have to guard. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And he uses this phrase here, guard the deposit entrusted to you. What's he talking about here? He's talking about ultimately the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which all of the word of God is centered around. And he then references what what is it that's coming against it? The irreverent babble and contradiction of what is falsely called knowledge. And so you're like, well, that doesn't seem that scary. I was thinking like guns and knives kind of scary. That doesn't seem that scary. Just some so-called know-it-all. Oh, friends, there's something worse than physical violence. It's the spiritual destruction of people's souls that Paul is warning Timothy about. 
You see, Paul is telling Timothy about this heretical group called Gnostics who claim to have a special spiritual knowledge. They claimed with this knowledge that they got it from visions and other experiences that was beyond what God's Word had said. They claim to have hidden truths in the Old Testament Scriptures, especially with genealogies. They get caught up in the genealogies and the numerical sequencing. They considered matter to be evil. The Gnostics actually had a doctrine that was a strange mixture of Christianity, Oriental mysticism, Greek philosophy, and Jewish legalism. Like many of the Eastern cults that we can even see today, it offered something for everybody. Paul summarized all of that they were teaching with one devastating phrase, it's irreverent babble and contradictions. Paul is saying, guard the deposit entrusted to you. If you just look ahead at what he says here in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, this is now at the end of Paul's life, talking to Timothy one more time in writing. Look at what he says here. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that what you have heard from me and the presence of many witnesses entrust, entrust to faithful men who be able to teach others also. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the exact same thing he's talking about in 1 Timothy. There is a stewardship. It is like a baton. It's like a relay race. He's like, hey, what I have been protecting, what I have been guarding, I put into your hands. And what's been put into your hands, you're going to put into someone else's hands. And those someone else's hands, you're going to put them into someone else's hands. And this is going to continue on until Christ returns. And the church is under attack when that truth is being undermined, being set aside, or being reinterpreted to mean something other than the soundness of God's Word. This is why you as Christians care about the accuracy and the carefulness and the stewardship of God's Word. Too often, too tragically, you're being told to put away your Bibles and pick up something else that is better than the Bible because after all, the Bible itself and its revelation is really not enough. God has given other people new revelation, new experiences, new insights that can really teach you how to unlock who you are in life and be all that God's called you to be. And too often, just hooked along into that, God's call is for churches to be led by faithful men who will teach Christians to be faithful in their calling to follow the clear teaching of Scripture, having, having been guarded for them, entrusted to them, that they might entrust it to others also. This is why we pray not only for people, but for churches. Because as a church falls, so does the very stewardship and the reputation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A faithful pastor flees evil and pursues righteousness, fights for the faith, warns the rich, and guards the gospel. Why? So that in doing so, the people might grow in accordance with godliness and be all that God has called them to be as a people of God. That's what we're after here. We're after faithfulness to the Lord and a bright, clear, magnifying testimony of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been laboring for in 1 Timothy. That's what we're going to continue to passion for in the years to come. And if you stick around long enough, you're going to be a part of that and see others benefit from that as you herald the gospel yourself and God blesses accordingly. Let's pray for that now. This has been a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church or our senior pastor, Eric Bancroft, please click on the link below or visit castleview.org. 